Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tech.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing, tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. We have a lot of stuff to get through in today's video. I'd like to start things out, though, with AMD, as I've been speaking to a couple of sources recently, not only because of the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X stuff, which I covered rather extensively in yesterday's video. By the way, if you could put an F in chat for Amy, who had to edit almost an well, 50-ish minutes of video, uh, that would be appreciated. But also, I've been asking them various questions for AMD's CPUs, and I have a couple of small updates. So the first thing is Zen Freeze Performance, and what it will mean regarding Intel in terms of competitiveness. So, first of all, the performance information. Jim over at Adore TV recently put out a video rather extensively detailing Milan, and one of the things he said was that we're looking at around a 15% IPC gain in integer performance. Floating point is going to be mm, less than uh, that. It's probably going to be around the 10%-ish mark. But uh, it will be around 20% total performance with integer when you take clock speed into account with only single core. However, this will taper off naturally as more cores are being uh, loaded up with work. However, I was told that the figures that uh, were floating around if the pun was not intended, uh, inside of AMD actually may be a bit higher than that, and integer performance could be about 20%, not including the clock frequency. However, a different source told me that this is probably incorrect, and uh, we are looking at around 15%. So basically, I would say 15 to 20%. But what's quite interesting is that uh, both sources did agree on a couple of other points. The first is that the power consumption of the Zen Free server chips is considerably less than Intel's Ice Lake for the same equivalent performance, actually better performance. I actually was given the figures, but I was asked not to share them. But suffice to say, the difference is... Not good for Intel. That's all I'll say for now. Um, hopefully, uh, Intel will come back. Obviously, they've been getting hit really hard recently. Their stock price has gotten hammered. And for the first time in a long time, AMD's stock prices have just been absolutely going ballistic. I mean, they went up for a while and then they were kind of holding steady for a while. And then that was like the worst sentence in history, but whatever. And... Um, now they're just like skyrocketing again because of all of the recent announcements and obviously some uncertainty from Intel as well. And AMD are just really on a roll. And I also have a small update for Warhol. Now, as you are almost certainly aware, we've got Matisse, which is Ryzen 3000, based, of course, on Zen 2. Then the next uh, architecture will be Ryzen 4000, not to be confused with the APUs, which are based on the Zen 2 architecture. But instead, we're looking at the Mir, and this will be on the Zen 3 architecture. However, it still will use the AM4 platform. It's a bit ambiguous what X670 and its ilk will bring to the table. Obviously, with X570, we have features like PCIe 4, but uh, what X670 brings, I'm not 100% certain yet. I did actually cover this uh, a while ago in another video, um, but X570 to X670, it is kind of unclear what the difference is going to be. However... There was a rumour that we would actually not see the jump from AM4 to AM5 take place next year. Um, I was originally told that this was the plan, but possibly my source got confused or the information was inaccurate. And while we will see AM5, it looks like that's going to be the year afterwards. Slowed down, if nothing else, by the fact that DDR5 won't became, become excuse me, mainstream in the client segment for a couple of years yet. The reason I find this so interesting enough to report is because this source that has told me this has been ultra accurate in the past with several things, not least of which the um, 
the fact that we will see an 8-channel Threadripper processor, despite the fact that for a while it looked like AMD would not release this, despite the fact that we saw TRX80, uh, and then it just seemed to disappear. So there was a theory that maybe, you know, there wouldn't be an 8-channel uh, Threadripper processor, 8-memory channel Threadripper processor, but my source told me that no, that is still accurate, and well, yeah, <laughs> what what's actually releasing? So, I do have quite a lot of faith in this individual. Obviously, there have been other things as well that he has told me which have panned out to be pretty accurate. So, I do feel that there's a fairly decent chance that we will see Warhol. Unfortunately, what he didn't have is any details as to the specifications of the chip. It looks like it is some type of Zen 3 refresh, but whether that's similar to what we saw with Zen to Zen Plus, or whether it's something entirely different, I'm not certain. Another thing which possibly officially confirmed this, well, I say officially in very loose terms, was when I was being briefed about the B550 chipset and some other things as well. And this, of course, was a press briefing with quite a few members of the press. But one of the things that I was told, along with the other press, was that Originally, AMD had stated that AM4 would last until 2020, which was kind of when we expected to be cut off. However, it was implied that this ex this support may continue to extend the next year. So I'm going to be very interested if um, we actually see Warhol continue to uh, be on the AM4 platform and what type of support it would bring. If you watch my content regularly, you'll know that I often say chips do not take a couple of months to design and bring up. They are three to five year bets into the future of where the industry will be going and what customers, for example, Sony, Microsoft, or data centers or whatever, will want. It's not easy. But there is a slight difference when it comes down to refreshes because refreshes don't take as much time because the fundamental architecture doesn't need to change as much. There is still, of course, testing which needs to be done and some tweaks to the architecture if you're, for example, improving the process that the chip is being produced on or shrinking the process, or perhaps you are changing something subtle on the processor. It still does take time, but not the three to five years that an entire new architecture would take. But one thing my source told me is that AMD with Warhol had been planning this for a long time, and this was not something that had been decided, let's say, in 2018 or 2019. Instead, it was perhaps something that they had decided when the original Zen processors were being created and AMD were internally deciding their roadmaps. And next up, I'd like to discuss with you NVIDIA and a possible acquisition of ARM. ARM is apparently up for sale, and Apple allegedly are not interested in the acquisition of ARM, but one company which apparently is, well, NVIDIA. And this would make NVIDIA an absolute massive player. Well, they're already a massive player, but an even more massive player in certain industries. One major advantage that Intel has, as well as AMD, is their ability to create not just the GPU, but also the CPU as well, which, for the sake of argument, let's look at the next generation consoles. AMD are able to customize the APUs for the individual console manufacturers. So if Microsoft want a specific feature, they can ask AMD to include that feature, like, for example, enhancements for backwards compatibility, and Bob's your uncle. But with NVIDIA, they can, of course, acquire... Uh, ARM licenses, or they can uh, create socks. For example, we've seen this with like Tegra with the Switch and other usages. But having the ability to basically produce the chips themselves and customize designed from the ground up with this would be very interesting. I don't want to do a full in-depth analysis in this particular video because I feel that I could discuss this rather at length. Um, but I would be very curious if NVIDIA does purchase ARM. Um, it would definitely change the industry somewhat in a variety of different um, uh, a variety of different industries. 
Obviously, they may also change the way that they approach the data center, but other devices too, like perhaps smartphones, could definitely be influenced, and also other low-power devices such as tablets, maybe low-power laptops. I think it's a pretty smart acquisition for NVIDIA, and NVIDIA have also been purchasing tons of companies recently, including networking, artificial intelligence, and blah, 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 because... Obviously, when they acquire these companies, that technology, well, it's a bit like the Borg, really. Your distinctiveness will be, well, brought into our, our own. And now we are going to mosey, mosey, I say, over to the Xbox Series X and some information on Halo Infinite. We're going to start things out with some information that Review Tech USA has actually plonked onto his YouTube channel. Now, this is allegedly from a employee who works at Xbox Game Studios. And Rich has apparently done a lot of validation on the person's credentials, and I have no reason to disbelieve him, because quite honestly, a lot of what he says here fits in terms of just logical conclusions of what you would expect uh, from Microsoft. Now, I won't regurgitate all of what Rich has to say. I want to focus primarily on the tech stuff, and then we're going to move over to some official comments, actually, from Microsoft, which even further explains uh, Halo uh, Infinite. But... Uh, there are a couple of things I'd really like to discuss with, about what Richard said, and as I said, I'll link uh, Richard's video in the description of this one. So according to Rich, originally the uh, Halo Infinite project was rather different to what it's turning out to be now. For example, it was originally planned to use the Unreal Engine, and you were going to be able to fly largely over pretty much the entire game map, but now it's apparently becoming more like islands, I suppose. And there were quite a lot of uh, pieces of drama behind the scenes, and as I said, Rich goes into that rather extensively, but... They are also using a lot of different development kits for the bring-up of Halo, and I'm going to go over them now. So we have Durango, which is the Xbox One development kit, Edmonton, which is Xbox One S, Scorpio, which is the One X, Chakwala, which is an unreleased-slash-unknown prototype of the Xbox One X, we have Scarlet, which is the Xbox Series X, Anaconda, which is the Series X, Dante, which is an experimental build of the Xbox Series X, and then finally Condor, which is allegedly mid-spec for PCs. Because this is not the first time we're hearing about Dante. Uh, recently, The Verge put out an article which states that Dante has a basically a mode which essentially emulates the performance of Lockhart. For example, it allows just 7.5 gigabytes of RAM to be usable for games developers, which I think makes logical sense in terms of developmental uh, practices of Game Studio. Another very interesting thing is some comments officially from 343 slash Xbox regarding the aesthetics of Halo and also comments regarding the performance targets of the game. Amy did go over this somewhat. For example, she mentioned that it's a quite an early build of Halo, but this has been further explored. I'll link the WC article in the description. Chris Lee says, I think for the response and graphics, the thing I hope is that folks get a chance to check out our 4K streaming assets. I think this really lets our game show itself in full fidelity. We are definitely very much in development and we have some polishing and tuning the team is working on to really bring the full potential of our experience to the fans of this year and Halo Infinite. We have definitely uh, been excited about the ambition of the title of this open expansive campaign and we'll make sure that it's polished and ready to go when fans get their hands on it this holiday. I still think that they're kind of running out of time but okay. The gameplay demo is a great example of how we're running on the Xbox Series X. Just as a reminder, it was actually being shown on a PC development kit. Um, we're able to run at a solid 60 frames per second at up to 4K. And I'll get into that in a second. And we're able to bring the highest fidelity experience we've ever created. And 10 times the processing per uh, pixel we're able to do with Halo 5. They also mentioned that music is incredibly important, and because of the additional 
audio processing ability of the next generation Xbox. It's really able to leverage and create a really impressive audio experience. Now I'm very interested in the up to 4K. Does that mean that if things get really busy, will we see dynamic resolution come into play? And honestly, I think dynamic resolution or at the very least performance and uh, high fidelity visual modes is going to be a thing for the next gen overall. Um, we've seen it, for example, with the new Spider-Man on the PlayStation. You've got performance mode and you've also got a high fidelity mode. With the high fidelity mode, it has bells and whistles like hardware-based ray tracing enabled, but conversely, if you disable that, you have higher performance, in other words, uh, higher frame rate, but you also lose certain visual features. I think that in the majority of cases, it will be down to the GPU as the limiting factor. My personal opinion is that it's going to take a couple of years, as always, with any console generation to see fully what these systems are capable of. I mentioned in a video yesterday where I was extensively going over the bring-up of the PS5 and quite a few other things on the GPU and also some Xbox stuff too, that final development kits, especially for the PlayStation, to my understanding, have only started to roll out recently with the mass-produced dev kits. So because of this, some of the dev tools have not been exactly final, which means oftentimes developers are essentially working on target PC hardware. I think it's going to be, as always, a couple of years for developers to really get a handle on things, but the next generation is not unlimited power. It is not Emperor Palpatine in console form. There are finite resources on any system, and smart uses of those resources are going to be ultimately how developers crank out the most visually. I think Microsoft should not have shown the build that they did for Halo Infinite. The thing is, they were between a rock and a hard place. Obviously, if they hadn't have shown any Halo Infinite stuff, or at least extensive Halo Infinite stuff, they'd have gotten criticised for not, but also, of course, they essentially showed off a build which did not show the game in the best light. And I think they should have showed the better looking version of the build, which obviously there was like a minute or so of gameplay trailer. But, um, well, it is what it is now. Hopefully we see uh, the studio really pull it together towards the last minute. With that said, though, I think that's just about it for this particular video. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. The normal stuff, if you did, like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.